Hello and welcome to Ocean Calls, the podcast making waves on the issues that matter on our blue planet. I'm your host, Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes. If you're already familiar with our show, you'll have learned about all kinds of issues that our oceans face today as a result of human activity. We've heard experts debate everything from marine plastic pollution to the impact of overfishing. And today, in this final episode of our first season of Ocean Calls, we want to ask a very important question. Can we turn back time and restore our seas? Bright red, purple, vivid green or yellow, corals come in all shapes, colours and forms and these incredible sea creatures can look like a magical forest. Coral reefs are one of the richest ecosystems on Earth, home to a quarter of all marine life. They also protect communities on land from the sea and offer an invaluable source of food. These ecosystems are also dying because of pollution, overfishing, and the effects of climate change on the ocean. When the corals die, so do many other animals that depend on them. So what can be done? Can we repair the damage? Can these and other precious ecosystems like seagrasses and mangroves not only be preserved, but also actively restored? And that question of ocean restoration is what we're talking about in this episode. And joining us is a leading expert in the field who's on a mission to make it happen, Professor Carlos Duarte, the Executive Director of the Coral Research and Development Accelerator Platform, also known as CORDAP. Hello, Carlos. Hello. And to share his vision of ecosystem restoration, I'm joined by an ocean acidification expert and IPCC contributor, Professor Jean-Pierre Gattuso, Research Director at the Laboratoire Océanographique de Villefranche-sur-Mer in the south of France. Hello, Jean-Pierre. Hello, Jeremy. And at the end of the episode, you'll hear, as usual, a famous person talking about their favourite marine animal. And today, it's Mission Blue founder, legendary oceanographer and pioneer in the use of modern scuba gear, Sylvia Earle. Now, just quickly, a couple of points to bear in mind. This conversation was recorded in September, right after the warmest heatwave on record in Europe, which led to sustained and damaging heatwaves in the Mediterranean Sea. And the warm weather also meant you can hear the bustling life around Jean-Pierre's seaside office in the background. So... We want to try and understand how we can restore the oceans. But first, let's try and understand the situation we're in. Jean-Pierre, you're in the south of France. Can you paint a bit of a picture of the state of the sea where you live, where you go diving, where you're doing some of your research? In terms of the state of the sea, the wildlife, what's missing, I suppose? What's there? What are you noticing? What are the changes? I am based in the south of France uh, on the French Riviera. Uh, which has been extensively urbanized uh, in the past uh, decades. Approximately 20% of the coastal zone between the surface and 10 meter depth is uh, lost. We are just getting out of a marine heat wave, which uh, plagued uh, this area very much. We broke uh, the warmest uh, temperature in Villefranche, 28.2 degrees. This leads to mass mortalities. So climate change in this area is uh, going very fast and is affecting my life. Carlos, you're close to the Red Sea. What, what are the pressures that you see on the ecosystem there at the moment? So we have hundreds of kilometers of pristine environment where the desert meets the beautiful Red Sea. Then uh, there has been, as in the Mediterranean, a strong impact of climate change on the Red Sea and on the heat wave that... Uh, swap uh, many of the coral reefs across the Pacific and Indian Ocean in 2015. But basically, we had like 80% mortality of the coral reefs in the Southern Red Sea, and they haven't recovered yet seven years after. 
we're talking about ocean restoration. What does it really mean that we're talking about doing? What are the kind of the actions that you would like to start taking or that you are already taking now? So if I can take first on that question, I guess uh, Jean-Pierre will also add his own views. Jean-Pierre and I co-author a paper called Rebuilding Marine Life in year uh, 2020 in the journal Nature, where we put forward the idea that it should be possible to rebuild largely the abundance of marine life that we have lost, which is roughly 50% of the blue natural capital of our oceans, if we take on five main actions. So one of them is to protect species. One is to protect spaces, marine protected areas. Another one is to remove uh, pressures, including addressing climate change with uh, a high level of ambition to uh, meet the best possible targets in achieving uh, our climate goals. Then it's also to harvest uh, wisely and to uh, remove pollution. So if we engage on those, we believe we can achieve a rebuild of many of the elements of the ocean that were depleted through multiple pressures, but that also requires active restoration. So it's just if we just protect the spaces, but we allow recovery to happen just without assistance from humans, that is going to be very slow and more vulnerable than if we actively engage in giving a helping hand to nature. Well, uh, the paper that Carlos was uh, talking about, the one he led, really shows uh, very successful stories. Successful stories of restoring uh, mangroves, uh, salt marshes, uh, also successful stories uh, concerning governance, the, the contribution of governance to improving uh, and rebuilding marine life. So clearly, uh, efforts are made. Uh, you know, it's possible to restore uh, uh, marine biodiversity. There are roadblocks, and uh, one of them, the big one, is uh, climate change. But in many places, it is still possible to do. And uh, the stunning example that Carlos uh, identified is the one in Vietnam, uh, the Mekong Delta, which in uh, how many years? Uh, a few decades, uh, maybe 30 years, has been uh, completely rebuilt after the Vietnam War. That example is basically where the Americans completely raised these mangrove swamps. They all wiped off the map, right? And then they were replanted and restored actively. Did they come back as they were, or are they different to how they were, but thriving? If I wasn't a trained botanist when I worked there, I would have thought that that was a pristine mangrove forest. But uh, being a trained botanist, then I saw that the forest was less diverse than it should be because it was restored from nurseries composed mostly or two or three species, which are the ones with the highest forestry value in terms of timber. So it was lacking much of the diversity of trees and species that would be otherwise present in a pristine mangrove forest. But then images released by the U.S. Air Force uh, some years ago uh, showed that there was almost no tree left and everything was burned to the ground by a effective combination of a uh, herbicides and napalm that were used to destroy that mangrove forest, 2,500 square kilometer. Then what was achieved by very simple means by the Vietnamese people after the war in about a decade was truly remarkable. Uh, so they calculated that in about 20 years after the restoration was completed, the mangrove forest had sequestered in the soils an amount of carbon equivalent to five years, full years, of national annual emissions of Vietnam. Did you know that sequestering carbon dioxide means capturing and storing it? Sequestered carbon is carbon that's been taken out of the atmosphere, reducing the concentrations of CO2 and slowing the rate of global warming. Plants sequester carbon as they grow, and the ones with deeper roots, like mangroves, are very efficient at it, Coastal wetlands are a fantastic carbon sink if they're preserved, maintained or restored. Jean-Pierre, seagrass meadows, as far as I've understood, are very good for dealing with the big problem that you're an expert on, ocean acidification. How significant is that, actually? Well, uh, every marine plant, uh, you know, doing photosynthesis uh, ameliorates uh, ocean pH by... Uh, absorbing CO2 and uh, producing organic matter. 
And in the case of seagrass, uh, storing some of this organic matter in the sediment, in the soil, that's the uh, contribution uh, that uh, Carlos was mentioning to uh, minimizing climate change. But can it have a genuine impact other than a local one? That's to say, can you have change some of the ocean chemistry by, by planting a lot of seagrass? No, I mean, uh, one has to be realistic. You know, the ocean pH is declining over the whole surface area of the world ocean. That is a gigantic surface area. And there is no way that coastal plants uh, can uh, ameliorate the situation in any significant manner. But locally, it can be important. Uh, also, you know, in connection with uh, mariculture, with uh, growing uh, seashells, uh, mussels, oysters, uh, if they are located close to uh, extensive uh, marine plants, uh, then uh, possibly uh, it's uh, beneficial to uh, growing shells and uh, calcifying animals. But ocean acidification, as far as you're concerned, is not something we could file under restorable in any way? At the global scale, no. Uh, there is a way to uh, stop uh, the decline in uh, ocean pH, and that is, of course, uh, getting to net zero uh, CO2 emissions. Restoring uh, ocean pH to what it was uh, at uh, pre-industrial times uh, will take uh, hundreds of years. It will be done because the ocean has a, a mechanism to do that by uh, dissolving ca calcium carbonate sediments, but it will take many hundreds of years. What are the real effects of ocean acidification and what kind of impacts are they having on, on life in the ocean at the moment? Well, the reason it is discrete, uh, it is because it's, uh, you know, the the other uh, major uh, climate change variable is temperature. And there, the uh, effects are tremendous and uh, started uh, many years ago and are getting even more visible. The effects of uh, ocean acidification uh, today are relatively uh, discrete and less, uh, much less visible. They mostly affect uh, calcifying organisms. Uh, it is beneficial to some very few uh, species, you know, like uh, marine plants. Uh, and uh, it is not. Uh, it is in a few decades that ocean acidification will become a, a big uh, issue. Today, it is an issue for some species, for some uh, communities. But the big, the big uh, risk is uh, about ocean warming. Carlos, you're very focused on corals. We know that corals around the world are at threat. Tell us about restoring corals. How can you possibly manage to do that for corals? We yet don't have a good model how to restore them. And coral restoration projects tend to be very expensive, tend to have a very small footprint of only a few hundred square meters, and tend to be rather unsuccessful so that in some areas like in the US coral restoration projects, the long-term success is only about 10%. So only one in every 10 corals that was outplanted uh, survives in the long term. So if one actually searches in a healthy environment and looks to marginal environments, which might be, you know, in the shallow waters around a mangrove next to the coral reef where the water is relatively stagnant, the water quality is poor, one can see a few colonies of uh, corals not looking like much able to survive there. So the concept that is emerging is that we just don't do restoration with randomly collected corals or the same coral stock that was actually wiped out by the heat wave because the outcome will be that the next heat wave will wipe out the outcome of our restoration efforts. So what we need to do is to develop the capacity to do a mass throughput crossing of those marginal corals with the healthy corals. So we select a genotypes and phenotypes that are able to have a higher thermal resistance and even resistance to lower pH than the average coral that is present in the environment and start restoring with those corals that have been selected rather than do it randomly. And are you doing that now? We're doing that now. And how's it going? We started uh, out planting them in the Red Sea about a year ago. And uh, so the long-term success, we will be only able to report, let's say, a decade from now. But for all we know, in terms of challenging the corals, with experimental uh, extremes, this should be one to two degree more resistant than the ones that were present in the water before. Jean-Pierre, is one to two degrees enough? Well, it depends uh, what we do uh, with respect to uh, 
the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. I mean, we are we are now at 1.2 degree globally, uh, the increase in temperature of the ocean. I got the feeling, Jean Pierre. Let's be honest. That I get the feeling that you're trying to be optimistic, but that you're not really absolutely convinced. I am not convinced, but not for the reasons you have in mind. I'm not convinced by the scale of the operation. Uh, I, I have fully support and uh, the research that is being performed on um, heat resistant corals is uh, very good, very promising. And I'm sure it will lead to major uh, developments, both in science and in technology. But how are you going to restore uh, hundreds of kilometers, square kilometers of uh, reefs, you know, like uh, the Great Barrier Reef, 2200 uh, kilometers long? There is a problem of scale. Uh, the, and I think it is important that uh, uh, decision makers are not uh, mistaken, that they, they feel, well, if we are doing that today, never mind, uh, you know, in 20 years time, we will have the technology to restore things as they were. Uh, that is uh, certainly not true. And um, it, is, it is important that uh, efforts are being done for mitigation yeah, cut the emissions, right? That's the fastest way to try and fix the problem is cut the emissions. There are countries, you know, that uh, prefer to invest in uh, blue carbon ecosystems or, uh, you know, increasing resilience of uh, coral reefs such as Australia. At the same time, increasing tremendously the uh, mining of coal and exporting coal. In This is uh, not the way to do it. I mean, uh, you cannot do both. I mean, you need to cut down on uh, the use of fossil fuels and adapt uh, with the technology that uh, Carlos uh, was uh, describing. And I agree with Jean-Pierre that the scale is certainly an issue, but when we have a fire, we go out and replant the forest, even though there might be risk that is going to be burned again. When we have a coral reef that bleaches, we grieve and we move on, but we don't try to restore it. So I think there's a lack of ambition and there's nothing really inherent to the scale that cannot be done if you calculate how many corals will need to be outplanted to restore the abundance of corals in the ocean, that's half a trillion. So it's half of the trillion trees. And yet it is true, we don't know how to do it at scale, but the fact that we don't know to do how to do the scale should not prevent us from trying because there's so many millions, hundreds of millions of lives which are supported by corals that we can look at the face of those people who are typically in developing nations, not in Australia, that whose livelihood depends on corals and tell them, sorry, your coral is to go away and we are not going to do anything about it. If you do this, then do you also reintroduce the species that would live there on those reefs or do they just turn up because you've happened to have made a nice habitat for them? Most of these species actually have pelagic uh, propagules, so they have larvae and life stages that are uh, released into the water column and move with the flow, so they can actually colonize from uh, very far away uh, sources. But in fact, there's one new restoration technique, uh, particularly addressing that problem, that uses soundscapes, which has been proven experimentally successful. So a healthy reef has a particular soundscape and it has been shown uh, playing back the soundscape of a healthy reef that fish larvae and invertebrate larvae actively swim towards that source. So they're being called a uh, home. Did you know that coral reefs are under relentless pressure from all kinds of environmental stresses, ranging from overfishing, pollution, to the biggest of them all, global warming? When corals get stressed, they expel the microscopic algae that live within them, which is also their source of food. This is what's known as coral bleaching, and at that moment they are still alive, but they're very vulnerable to disease, and they can only recover when they reabsorb the algae. Isn't there a chance, though, Carlos, that we're sort of giving ourselves a kind of false hope? I mean, I admire you for wanting to try, and you're right that we've got to try and move the range of what possible is, um, but that we can fall into a false sense of confidence in science. Well, I entirely disagree with your statement. I don't think I'm falsifying my research by trying to restore. Our ambition on restoration should not be limited to corals and mangroves and seagrass and so forth. It should also aim at restoring the atmosphere. 
but we already have an excess amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is a threat. If we just get a net zero, we're going to be uh, committing future generations of humans to live with levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that would be dangerous. So once we develop the, the technology for carbon removal, which we need to do, then we need to go on beyond net zero and actually restore the atmosphere. And uh, in fact, we uh, described the uh, you know, restoration of blue carbon ecosystems as low regret uh, solutions. We highlighted the fact that uh, at the global scale, uh, they contribute uh, relatively little to uh, mitigation, maybe around uh, a few percent, maybe two percent. But there are so many benefits, uh, additional benefits, uh, you know, food security, uh, protection of uh, land from uh, uh, from uh, erosion. Um, but we're kidding ourselves to imagine that we can get back to where we were a hundred years ago or something like that, right? And, but w whatever it happens, whatever we restore, it won't be restored to as new or as it was before we started polluting the atmosphere. Well, of course it cannot because some of the land is now uh, used for uh, purposes uh, that uh, cannot be displaced, like harbors or cities or uh, jetties. Um, but uh, we can go a long way uh, by restoring the, the marine environment. And uh, the goal shouldn't be to go back to 1800. Uh, that's not possible uh, for the reasons I explained. But there is a lot of uh, progress and a lot of uh, successes ahead. Carlos, what's your sort of dream situation a few decades down the line when you've cracked how to do this? My vision for the future, and is one that I'm committed because I belong to the generation that created much of the problem. So many of the species that have gone extinct and about half of the total stock of greenhouse gas uh, gases that have gone in excess relative to the historical abundance have been delivered during my lifespan. So I feel a responsibility to the next generations to contribute to fix the problem. And my vision is that by 2050, we can have not only net zero and even beyond net zero in terms of greenhouse emissions, but we can also restore about two thirds of the lost abundance of marine life. But that needs active restoration. Both of you seem to be cautiously positive about the ability to make these restoration efforts work. Do you ever feel a bit alone, though, in your conversations when you're talking to other scientists who may be a bit more cynical or concerned about the amount of financing or the political support that you'll get? Are you kind of ever alone on this one? I think that my biggest concern on that is that I see many colleagues that think that action for climate or even biodiversity is a zero-sum game. So that means if we allocate resources to restoration, those uh, resources are going to be taken away from mitigation efforts or the like. And that actually leads to, I would say, unproductive conversations. What we need to do is to recognize that we need to do all of the above, and then we need to work uh, constructively on how do we release the financial resources that are, are going to be required to do both. Some colleagues, uh, and I am among those colleagues, we are starting to wonder about, as scientists, are we doing the best we can to promote those ideas? We deliver many papers, uh, reports, IPCC and others. Uh, we go to COP meetings and, uh, you know, presenting the science and what we can do and uh, what we shouldn't do and what we can do. And um, we have the feeling that uh, many governments do not listen, or they listen, but uh, implementation of uh, decisions is uh, lagging behind. And uh, I am among those people who are becoming upset about it. And uh, many of my colleagues are turning into activism. Uh, there is uh, a need uh, to uh, be more voiceful and uh, to carry the voice of science, but also the voice of citizens. You know, we are knowledgeable citizens and we should uh, carry the message uh, perhaps uh, in a stronger uh, way than what we have uh, done so far by producing papers to, conferences, talks, and reports. It's very um, powerful stuff. Thank you. I'm going to end with a quick yes, no answer. In a limited scope, is it possible to restore the oceans? Carlos? Yes. Jean-Pierre? Yes.
Two yeses. Very good. Well, well done. Thank you very much. It's been really interesting talking to you. And I think that there's a lot to take away from that conversation. It's made me think a great deal. And I hope it has everybody who's listening too. Jean-Pierre Gattuso and Carlos Duarte, thanks very much for joining us on Ocean Calls. Well, thanks for listening to the episode so far. And now it's time for Ocean Favourites, the part of the show where a famous person tells us about their favourite marine species. Today, it's a legend in the underwater world, a woman who held the record for the deepest untethered dive and without whom modern diving wouldn't be the same. Sylvia Earle tells us all about her Ocean Favourite. I'm Sylvia Earle. It is really hard for me to pick out out of the gazillions of creatures who live in the sea a favorite. I mean, I love jellies. <laughs> Just imagine ballooning around in the ocean with your body almost totally water or being a mighty bluefin tuna and streaming through the ocean or to think about creatures who live in the deep sea with lights down your side. I'd love to have lights down my side. Oh. And it's the splendor of the complexity and diversity of life together that really moves me. But if if I had to choose one, just one sea creature, I suppose I'd have to look in the mirror and say, gotta be humans. We are sea creatures too. If you like to breathe, if you like the fact that water (laughs) is around, falling out of the sky as rain, sleet, and snow recharging the rivers, lakes, and streams, and the ocean, then you should realize that with every breath you take, you're connected to the sea. Even if you've never seen or touched the ocean, it touches you. It touches you. You can't exist without the ocean. And I love the fact that we can go deeper than any air-breathing creature because we can tuck ourselves in little submarines and go to the deepest place in the ocean. Even whales can't do that. And to go beneath where sunlight shines, that is the privilege. That has really shaped much of my thinking and appreciation for the ocean to realize that most of life on Earth lives in the dark all of the time. In a submarine, you can go to Let's say at 100 feet, 30 meters, it's darker than at the surface. And the world is mostly blue. The deeper you go, the bluer it gets. And then all light disappears. At a depth of 1,000 feet, 300 meters or so, it is dark. A little, just a trace of sunlight penetrates. A little bit deeper than that, and it truly is dark, except for the flash and sparkle and glow of luminous creatures that that communicate with light. It may be the most common form of communication on Earth when you think about it. Bioluminescence, that firefly kind of light that's uncommon above the surface of the sea, but it is really the ordinary thing for creatures to be able to make little sparks of light or or glowing aspects of your anatomy, to be able to attract mates or to communicate messages or to lure prey to come within your grasp. So many ways that light is used, but it's within a place that is, is noticeably very dark. And to realize that from the depth where sunlight shines to the maximum depth seven miles, 11 kilometers down. It's the biggest living space on Earth. It's where most of life is. It's deep within the ocean and it's amazing. So I'm really pleased to be a representative of a sea creature that really has a heavy weight right now of taking care of the ocean. We've done a pretty good job of harming the ocean over our history, but now we have a job of taking care of it. And that's what I'm trying to do.
Well, our thanks to Sylvia Earle for taking time out at the UN Ocean Conference to meet us for Ocean Calls. And that about wraps up this first season of Ocean Calls. We'll be back after the Christmas break with new conversations on the issues making waves on our blue planet. This podcast is created by ocean lovers here at Euronews for ocean fans around the world. And I'm your host, Euronews science reporter Jeremy Wilkes, and this series is produced by my colleagues Nairo Davlashian and Natalia Olsner. Editing is by Laurie Martinez, Chiara Santella and Luis Lopez from Studio Ochenta. The theme music is by Gabriel Dalmasso. Our editor-in-chief is Sophie Claude. For more on Carlos Duarte, go to at Carlos Duarte PhD on Twitter. Jean-Pierre Gattuso's Twitter handle is at JP Gattuso. And I recommend following Sylvia Earle on at Sylvia Earle. The podcast Ocean Calls is made possible by the European Commission's DG Mare, and you can listen to it on Apple, Spotify, CastBox, or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. If you like the podcast, please give us a five-star rating, comment, and tell your friends, because your help makes spreading the word about the ocean so much easier. If you want our team to read your comments on social media, then use the hashtag Ocean Calls. If you're looking for something else to listen to, then get your teeth into another Euronews podcast called The Star Ingredient, following African chefs on a mission to improve biodiversity and revive the continent's forgotten tastes. It really is a yummy little audio morsel. For more information on Ocean Calls, go to our website, euronews.com, and a special shout out to Ocean, a Euronews TV series created by our colleague and friend, Dennis Lottier, which is fantastic to watch. Have a look on euronews.com slash ocean. Follow world news from a European perspective on euronews.com. 